Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Joe Zero, Executive Director of the Children's Literacy Initiative. The Children's Literacy Initiative trains teachers to achieve literacy for children in high poverty school districts by third grade. Joel has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Joe, for joining us today. Thank you. Literacy is so important for any child and for any child's future. Talk about the Children's Literacy Initiative and your programs and how you help to achieve literacy and the fundamental building blocks for an education by third grade. Children's Literacy Initiative uh, focuses on ensuring that kids are able to read and write by the third grade. Uh, we operate across the country. We have offices in Chicago, uh, Philadelphia, and Newark. And we really do build teacher capacity to uh, use the best practices to, as you said, uh, teach those building block skills for early literacy. When you talk about teacher capacity, are yes. you talking about the number of teachers or the expertise of the teachers being trained or the ecosystem in which those teacher oper teachers operate? I'm talking about the skill of the teacher to be a great teacher in the classroom. So we are working with uh, classroom teachers so that they can accelerate the learning of the students in their class. Oftentimes, teachers who are in low-income schools in urban areas have children who come into their classrooms already reading well below grade level. So their task is actually harder than a teacher in more affluent communities where students are coming on grade level, where those teachers might have to increase the student learning by one year. One year of growth is what you would expect for a teacher. The teachers working in the schools in the most impacted areas actually have to do more than that. They have to get students reading a year and a half worth of growth or two years of growth. And oftentimes, when they come out of teacher certification programs, they haven't learned the skills, the best practices, to teach reading in a way that gets that kind of results. And not only do we have the issue with children coming into the schools well below the, the grade level that, that, that they're in, the schools themselves only deal with a sliver of the, uh, of the issue that these children have. The reason why these, children's, these children are coming into the schools uh, below grade level very often have to do with the fact that the environment that they're in um, is, is not one that is rich in literacy itself. The parents might not have the background mm -hmm. that other parents from affluent areas uh, may have. How do you help the teachers that you are training uh, deal with those aspects? It's true. I would not argue that uh, the economic uh, factors and the social environment plays a big part in how kids come prepared to school. It's absolutely so. But the most important factor in having a kid learn at grade level is the teacher. There's ample research that shows that having an effective teacher three years in a row eliminates all of the factors associ associated with the socioeconomic socio situation and circumstances of those kids. So it's the training and it's, it's sustaining that kind of educational experience for the child, making sure that the child does not suffer whiplash of having a great teacher, a trained teacher one year, a poorly trained teacher the next year, and perhaps a, a teacher with, with some training and some engagement uh, the third year. It's very important that, that the excellence be maintained through a three-year period. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very important that you get continuity and excellence in your teaching force. We focus on making sure kids can read and write by third grade. Third grade is a pivotal time. Uh, it's really the transition from learning to read to reading to learn. So if a child hasn't learned to read by third grade, when they go on to fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, they aren't prepared to read to learn. To some extent, ensuring that kids can read by third grade is somewhat of an inoculation or a booster shot for entering a classroom with a teacher that's a little bit less prepared. A student that enters that fourth grade classroom with an underprepared teacher isn't going to learn to read, nor are they prepared to read to learn. So let's deconstruct some of your programs. How do your programs work? 
we focus on three areas to build the teacher's capacity. The first area we focus on is building teacher knowledge. What are those best practices? What are the building block skills for literacy? And we have trainings and workshops that support that. And that's typically where school districts stop. They offer professional development for their teachers. Oftentimes it's sporadic. They don't have enough time built into their collective bargaining union agreements to adequately train teachers. But when you think about adult learning, it takes more than just going to a workshop to learn something complex. So the first step is building that knowledge base. Second, we focus on making sure teachers have the best books and materials available. So we offer them uh, libraries of high uh, quality literacy books. Uh, we give them a range of other materials like whiteboards. So when a teacher is practicing phonics, she has that whiteboard and she can erase and have kids blend and do the kinds of best practices that build those skills. So when you say you're giving them whiteboards, is, is that you're, you're gifting uh, whiteboards to school districts and to schools? That's right. And, and, and then those are installed and they become now a part of the normal teaching tool for children in that classroom. That's exactly right. That's exactly, yes. We need to have kids in classrooms that are uh, literacy rich environments. And so books and teaching tools are essential to that. And so that's what we bring to the table. So the third is essential. So, so far we have, we've built the knowledge, we have the tools of the trade, if you will. Right. The third is the ability to practice and get feedback. So we provide coaching in-class, one-on-one coaching for teachers. So after that teacher has learned about, we'll call it guided reading, that teacher has the opportunity to see it modeled for her or him in the classroom, has the opportunity to co-teach around it, has the opportunity to have uh, a helpful, friendly, non-evaluative coach sit in the back of the classroom, take notes, and talk with her afterwards about how did that go? What are you working on? What needs to get better? It's that real-time feedback that is completely critical to developing the teacher capacity to make an impact. There are different state standards for uh, books um, and, and teaching methodologies. Do you adapt your program to each of the states or do you collectively uh, negotiate across states? Uh, how, do, how does that function? There's a big policy move now towards something called the Common Core Standards. And that's a consortium of states that have gotten together to determine what is it that a, a child needs to know and be able to do by a specific grade. And then you're, you're working with the states with a, with a focus on Common Core as a way to inform your programs? Absolutely. So all of our work aligns to the Common Core and the district initiatives going on. So we're curriculum agnostic. So if a district is working with a particular set of materials, we can work inside of that. We're working on building best teacher practice to use those materials. So often we train teachers in a catch and release kind of, uh, kind of way where we, where we take them out of their environment, we capture them, yes. we capture their attention, we lecture to them, and then we release them out into the wild and give them a handshake and say good luck and um, uh, it was nice to have known you. Right. And, and you're taking a different approach. Absolutely. And then we entrust them with our most critical resource, our children. So my background is in organizational learning. And when you think about what it takes for an, organizational, an organization to learn to be, to be good at what it does, and then you take a look at a school. What happens in a school if you're a teacher? You show up the first day and you plan your lesson and you work really hard at it, and you go into your classroom, and you teach. And you think about what, what went well and what didn't go well. Maybe in the coffee room you talk with a, a colleague for a second and say, you know, th this didn't go quite as well. What do you do? And then you go back the next day, and you plan your lesson. You go back into the classroom. You, you give it another shot. That is not a great setup for organizational learning. Let's compare it to uh, doctors or uh, firemen, where you have rounds, you have instructional rounds, where you talk about what's going on with a patient, you go to lectures, you have uh, your daily meeting with your colleagues to get insight. 
That doesn't happen in schools. And you have refreshed training. As, as uh, people move through their careers, right. they get refresher uh, courses and they're exposed to different pedagogies that, that perhaps early in their careers they hadn't. Uh, that's right. Done. One aspect that's very important with the work that we do is the training is immediately focused on the student needs. Because we're in the classroom with the teacher, we're helping that teacher diagnose the range of student needs along that literacy continuum. A teacher may have a, a group of students who are reading well and need to focus on comprehension. There might be a group of students that aren't reading fluently and need to work on fluency. And there might be a third group of students that needs to build their, their phonics skills. Right. It's a very complex thing to do. So we help teachers diagnose the student needs and then we provide the training specific to those needs. And they're segmenting the classes using work groups so that the teachers can help students evolve their own skills, empowering students so that in the future they can take these same work group skills, these same ideas of how do you learn yourself and apply them once they grasp the phonics and they grasp some of the literacy skills and they start reading to learn, they can then apply some of these same techniques for themselves. So in a sense, you're, 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 you're not only teaching the teachers, but the teachers are also gifting these students with, with the ability to, and the power to, to, to maneuver through knowledge in the future. Absolutely, and that's why third grade is so, such a critical, pivotal point. Um, so what you were talking about is, how do t teachers differentiate their instruction? to meet the range of needs of kids. And we take an articulated approach to that. So at first, we might work with you as a teacher on your whole group instruction at the beginning of the year. What are the rituals and routines you need to make sure that your classroom is running efficiently and the instructional time is used well? So whole group instruction is a teacher teaching to the entire class. Uh, sometimes in front of the class, sometimes interactively, but it's a whole class experience. That's right. So you could imagine um, a group of 25 uh, wiggly six-year-olds in your kindergarten. They need to learn certain patterns of behavior, rituals and routines about how to do school and how to do school in a way that opens their ability to learn. How to, how to settle down, how to listen, That's right. how to pick up your pencils or, and, and concentrate. Right, and when, we're do, when I'm talking about whole group instruction, it doesn't mean that the teacher is in front of the classroom le lecturing the students. <laughs> How do you engage? Not to a bunch of uh, third graders. No, no, it, that's, it doesn't work that well. It doesn't mean that you have rows of, uh, of desks and kids sitting quietly with their hands folded for that <laughs> instructor. I mean, for that instructor. But teaching a kid to turn and talk to her neighbor about what they just read and then turn back to focus on the teacher to move the lesson along, that takes some practice and some skill. And we help teachers to get that whole group instruction that is more often interactive than not because that's what kids love to do. They need to grapple with what they're hearing. They've got great ideas. They need to express it. The act of expressing what they're learning solidifies that knowledge and keeps them engaged. And after the whole group instruction segment, what comes next? So after the whole group instruction, and we've done some diagnostic assessments where we understand where kids are in their reading, then it's time to move to the small group instruction. So how are we going to group our kids? What kinds of centers are you going to set up? How are you going to make sure that the kids over in that corner are engaged in meaningful work? How are you going to check for understanding along the way? What are you going to do with your small group in front of you? Let's talk about how you demonstrate success. Great. What are your metrics that are embedded within your program to show that, that this approach is actually having an impact where you desire that impact to be? So we have a preliminary results from a third party evaluation that uh, we've been conducting or the American Institute for Research has been conducting as part of a large federal grant that we received. 
And those results are showing it was focusing on our impact in kindergarten and first grades. And those res results are showing that we're getting statistically significant um, academic gains in kindergarten and are impacting the literacy environment and teacher practice in K-1. So those are fantastic results for an organization that is outside of a school working to support a school. How is this evaluation being conducted? Do you go back to the children and, and uh, uh, test them or um, is there some other methodology that is being used to, f to track the children through fourth, fifth, sixth mm -hmm. grade? That, that's what's so fantastic about this study. It's a really robust, rigorous study where we have a cohort of schools that receive the intervention, the CLI work, and then we have a matched cohort of schools with similar kids, similar demographics that aren't receiving the, the intervention. Okay. And what they have done is they brought in... So it's a, a double blind It's a double blind, exactly, exactly. Which is unusual for a nonprofit working right. in the education space. And uh, they brought in their own assessment and students took the assessment and they compared the results and that's how they determined that there is a statistically significant increase in student learning. And that means for us that we're reliable. Our service, it is not random that we're getting results. Now, we get, figuring out whether or not you're getting results in schools is a tricky business. Right. We can't always rely on a multi, uh, not multi-million, but a very expensive evaluation to determine if we're succeeding or not. So we work with schools and districts to ensure that they have the reading assessments in place to make sure that we're making the progress that we need. And we don't want to just look at those results at the end of the year. It's important to build the systems in that school to make sure that we're tracking all the way along so you can make instructional decisions that are going to accelerate student learning. What are your future plans to roll out this to other school districts and to scale the, mm -hmm. the program? Mm -hmm. We're going to establish different hubs in large urban centers, staff them with the experts that are getting the results, um, reach out to the area philanthropy to help support it. But part of what we need to do as an organization is change the revenue mix of our model. So right now we are about 50% federally funded. We're 35% funded by philanthropy, right. individual donors, foundations, corporations, and about 15% fee-for-service from our schools and districts. Earned income. Earned income. In order to be a sustained, growing, viable organization, we not only need to expand that pie, but we need to change the pieces within that pie. We need to be less reliant on that federal funding and we need to increase our fee for service. But if I were a school or a district, most likely I'm operating under pretty uh, tight financial circumstances, right. right? So it's really critical that they spend their dollars on stuff that matters, stuff that works. So having that proof of concept is essential in our growth plans. So we can now say uh, to schools and districts, it's not just us telling you that we get results. It's a third party rigorous evaluation. So for every dollar that's invested in early literacy on a social scale yields $17 in return. There's great urgency uh, these days on, er, on pre-K and um, K through three um, literacy. The Obama administration just two days ago announced that um, ensuring kids can read by third grade is their second top priority in their My Brother's Keeper initiative. So the research is clear. Investing in reading, uh, early reading, pays dividends. And it's a matter of our country's future and our competitive standing in the world, and regardless as to what field of play. Education, right. it, all, it all starts with education. So when I think about what constitutes a healthy society, I think of um, economics. What's our employment rate? What does income distribution look like? I think of public health. What is infant mortality? What are rates of disease? What is life expectancy? I think of 
um, public safety? What are incarceration rates? Um, what is violent crime rates? Each of those has a direct line to how we educate our kids. So th there is no bigger lever in terms of impacting society than education. And within education, there's no important thing to make sure that gets done than getting kids to read by third and write by third grade. Joel Zero, thank you so much for sharing the experience of the Children's Literacy Initiative. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.